whole series, <laughs> we've been getting to know Jesus, right, through the writings of John the Apostle. We've been spending weeks and weeks and weeks going through this glorious gospel, and I'm grateful for the time to do so. In it, we've seen what others have said about Jesus. We've heard his teachings and also through the gospel witnessed his miracles. We have seen how people have reacted to him. Some people skeptical, some people embracing him as the Messiah, while others violently resisted him. We have marveled at Christ, and we have grown to understand how Jesus fulfilled the messianic, okay, the messiahic um, prophecies recorded in the Old Testament. And we've watched as Jesus' prophecies came true. We have beheld His courage and His love where He voluntarily stepped forward to take our place in the punishment for our sin. We've witnessed how he was betrayed and denied and abandoned and beaten and was crucified. We've seen as we are in this passage the disciples scattering and cowering and fear his dearest friends and his closest companions were hiding, and he is dead. But is he? This morning we're going to read the account of what happened next. Many ways for us as a congregation, Easter is coming early, how the text is laid out, and we will celebrate on Easter, of course. But here we are in this pregnant moment where it seemed that all hope had been lost, and this one that they thought was the Messiah was now laying in a tomb, heart broken, scattered, disillusioned, wondering what had taken place, wondering what would happen next. So we're going to turn to John chapter 20. If you have a Bible, open it up. The passage, of course, will be on the screens, but it's even better when you can read it for yourself on your phone or whatever you bring or in the pew Bible or actually a literal paper Bible. Do we still use those, right? Open it up as we see the unfolding story through the eyes of John, the beloved disciple, empowered by the Holy Spirit to find out what happens next and what it means for you, what it means for me, what it means for the whole world. Three points I want us to think about this morning. And by the way, you have been prayed for, and I trust that God would speak something to you today. The question is not, is God speaking today? Indeed, He is. The better question is, are we listening to Him? May God give us ears to hear, a mind to understand, a heart that would embrace what He has for us this morning. The first thing I want us to focus in, it, in on is Jesus invites us to see. We'll get there so we understand where I found or saw this point as we read the text and unpack it. So here we go, John chapter 20, starting with verse 10. We're going to read this first section up to verse 10, 1 through 10, and I'm reading from the NIV version. Here we go. Now, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running 
to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, who is John, by the way, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, now separate from the linen. Now finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Now, they still did not understand from the Old Testament Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples, these two, Peter and John, went back to where they were staying. Okay, let's pause there. Now, it's interesting, of course, all four Gospels describe this moment, the resurrection. Some include some details, others include other details. But the one thing all four Gospels share in common is they all start with the phrase, on the first day of the week. Now, why do they all emphasize this? They emphasize it for us to know that there is a cosmic shift. There is something new. Now, creation, as we read in the Genesis account, started on the first day of the week and ran its course to the last day in which God said, this is a day of rest. It went all the way through. This is the day at the end of worship. And that is why at that time and still today, those of the Jewish faith worship on Saturday. Now, Jesus could have risen that day, but no, it happened when? On the first day of the week. To signify this is something new. There was creation started on the first day, and now there's recreation that starts on the first day. It is new. That's why the church worships on Sundays and typically Sunday morning. Not that it matters which day you worship, but typically it's that because Jesus rose on the first day signifying that this is a new day, y'all. It's a new day, you all. Right? So, Mary Magdalene, one whom Jesus personally ministered to, and as the Gospels show, freed from the bondage of demons. She was a close disciple and an early follower from the beginning of Jesus, all the way through to the foot of the cross, as we saw last week. She, loving Jesus, came early to the tomb, not to celebrate, but to mourn. But when she arrived, she found an alarming sight. She thought that the tomb had been broken into. Someone broke into the tomb. The stone was rolled away. The seal had been broken. And she was alarmed. Someone stole his body. Who could have done this? Where did they take him? Why would this have happened? Shocked, literally shocked and horrified. She ran. She ran to where she knew Peter, his close friend, and John, his beloved friend, were staying to tell them, guys, guys, someone took his body. 
I don't know who did this or where they've hidden him. Now, her reaction tells us that she did not yet believe that Jesus was resurrected. She wasn't going there, right, in hopes that to see him come from the tomb, she thought he was dead, 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 dead. And she was heartbroken. She had no clue, even though she should have remembered what Jesus said. She was overcome with grief, overcome with what she witnessed, overcome with emotion, broken, hearted. Then she sees this, doesn't compute what happened here. Now, hearing this, Peter and John didn't waste any time, right? They full out ran, right? Wasting zero time to get there, right? And John, presumably, as as history tells us, was younger, so he outran the old man Peter, right? And he put it in there. (laughs) And the beloved disciple beat the punk Peter, right? He didn't say that, but it's kind of funny to me, right? He's just telling the truth, right? took off, right? John being often more thoughtful, right? He didn't go in, perhaps not to disrupt the scene, the crime scene, and he just looked in, saw the linen cloth. He was thinking about this. And it's by no shock that when Peter gets there, he charges right in, right? This is Peter, right? And we've seen this in his character as we've read about him, right? No shock. When Peter finally gets there, probably huffing and puffing, right? Went right in. And Peter saw not just the linens that were wrapped around his body, laying there, but also the head covering that was there, laying there. Now, After Peter had entered, John finally came into the tomb, and he saw the evidence up close for himself. And then the pieces came together in his mind. I could see John just trying to figure out what happened here, right? And noticing the linen cloth, right, if someone was there to rob the grave. By the way, there was four soldiers there. John doesn't include that because that's not his point, okay? He thought about, wait a second, if you were robbing a grave, you wanted it to be quick, right? And so you wouldn't go in there and then take the time to unwrap the body. Do, 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 do. Let's make sure we do this nice, right? The body would have been kind of mm, gross, probably, starting that process. Also was wrapped up with some really valuable spices, right? If they're there to rob it or to do whatever, right? They wouldn't have taken time to do this, right? And if it was indeed a dead body, it would be hard to carry. It would be a lot easier to carry if it was kind of wrapped together, right? And they could sell those linens, by the way. Especially the head piece, right? That was valuable. They just couldn't go down to the, you know, the local place to buy this stuff. It's hard to come by. It's expensive. And yet, here are the linens just left. And here is the head piece separated. It's like, wait a second. This, mm, they wouldn't leave that here. Surely they would have grabbed the body. Surely they would have taken these things. And even they unwrapped it, they would have taken that with them. But here it is, as if the body just went through it. I imagine John thinking about this, looking at the evidence... And then it dawned on him. (laughs) 
Jesus said this was going to happen. It happened. That moment he believed. The tomb, by the way, the stone, by the way, was not rolled away so Jesus could get out. It was rolled away so we could get in. The one who could go through simple cloth could certainly go through the ground, which is good news for us, by the way, because when these mortal bodies are clothed with immorality, we're not going to be stuck in the ground. Oh, someone let me out. It's not happening that way. We, too, will have a new body. It's a continuation of these bodies, but it is different. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's the same but different. Jesus didn't need the stone to roll away to get out of there, but he made sure it was so that we could get in. Jesus invites us to come and see. Do you understand this? The Gospels were written and preserved so that you and I could come and see, understand, observe his teachings, hear about his miracles, put ourselves in the place of those who witness these things as witness after witness after witness lines up to testify as they point back to scriptures that talked about this Messiah and they see it happen time and time and fulfill time and time again. You and I have been given an invitation to come and see. Jesus wants us to observe. This is helpful. Jesus invites us to see. Look to the prophecies. And I've put some in your notes about various places in the Old Testament that talks about this. And John the writer said, mm, we should have known this. Right? It was in the Old Testament scripture. We weren't paying attention. Right? Writes it here. But John at that moment believed. Right. All of the evidence, by the way, that John is telling through the account of this gospel that he wrote is to point to the true identity of this one called Jesus, right? Who is the Christ, who is the Son of God. And if you believe in Him, trust yourself to him. Understand what he's done for you. <laughs> Treasure him because he lives so will you. You will have life in his name. Born again into a living hope and an inheritance kept in the heaven for you. John writes to us and will you see you understand, will you believe based upon the evidence? Most of us, perhaps, in this room have done so. Praise God for that. Some of us are still there wondering and thinking and questioning. Will you choose to believe on the basis of of the evidence of what you have seen in and from and with Christ. Jesus invites you to see and believe. So now John continues to record what happened next. John was convinced. Peter, don't know, Mary, not yet, right? So Peter and John, after observing this tomb, went back to where they were staying while Mary Magdalene went back to the tomb. Perhaps they went a different way because they didn't connect in between. And in this next section, we're going to learn another marvelous truth about Jesus. He calls us by name. 
John 20, we continue reading, starting with verse 11. Now Mary went back to the tomb. She stood outside crying. Right. This wasn't just boo-hoo, I'm sad tears. This was weeping, weeping, weeping. The loss of the one she loves so dearly. Weeping. As she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb. And there in the tomb sat two angels in white. And they were seated where Jesus' body had been. One was at the head and the other one was at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? <laughs> and still not understanding, she says, they've taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they put him. What this, she turned around, saw Jesus standing there. Some guy, maybe the gardener, didn't realize who it was. And, they, <laughs> and he asked her, <laughs> same question, woman, why are you crying? She responded the same way, they've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they put him. Thinking what was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him. I'll go get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him, <laughs> cried out, an Aramaic, a bony, which means teacher. This is a powerful and enduring scene. Mary went back to the tomb again in great grief and weeping. And this time, as we just read, she looked into the tomb, <laughs> seeing two angels in white, and noticed the detail, right? one at each end of where Jesus had been laying right, on that slab. And in thinking about it just this week, it reminded me of another slab that two angels were put on the either end. It was called the Ark of the Covenant, right? which that cover was called the mercy seat. I believe this symbolic gesture of these angels sitting at other ends were saying, this is the mercy seat. This, because of this, you receive forgiveness and mercy from God for your sins. It's powerful. And they're showing here, Mary, do you understand what this is? Do you understand what you're beholding? She had not yet put the pieces together. And then Jesus himself shows up. Like the gardener, the same gardener who put the original couple in the original garden, was there. And what he asked her was the same as what the angels asked her, exact same wordage, 
So there was a connection. They represent me, Lord. And then he said her name. I'm going to tell you what, we're going to need no name tags in heaven. Jesus calls his own. The good shepherd knows his sheep by name. And if you are under the care of this shepherd, he knows you. And he'll call you by name. Now I can't imagine being in the shoes of Mary. She's been on a roller coaster, right? Whoa. And now as she's weeping, not understanding, not seeing. She heard her Savior's voice, Mary. And the, (gasps) could it be him? She turned, saw him, clung to him as we're going to read. Hope beyond hope, he's alive. It's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. Sometimes I imagine what it would be like to be her, and I imagine what it's going to be like to see him. When he speaks my name, when he speaks your name. This is not some removed deity. It's not some uh, theological concept. It's a person who loves you, knows you, that we can relate to, and be like, be close to. This is remarkable. And also, in reading this section, I, I couldn't help but ask the question, why don't the angels show up to John and Peter, right? They could have done that, right? They could have, you know, shown themselves. Why did they show themselves to Mary? I think this was a mercy of Christ. Saying, Mary, you know what demons are like. You, are, you know them. Let me show you the angels. Let me show you the goodness of God. You've seen the depths of rebellion. Behold this great reversal. This is the kindness of God to her. No, Jesus calls your name. You have not, nor will you ever, as one of his children, be forgotten by him. Ever. It should encourage you. It should strengthen you. Your value comes from the one who knows your name, not your dad, not your brother, not your mom, from your creator. Knows you. That helps us, endears us, connects us. He is the good shepherd who calls his sheep by name. It's powerful. The third thing in this passage is this. Right? I want us to focus on. There's other things to focus on, but I'm asking us to focus on these. Next, Jesus entrusts us to share. This is John 20. I need another tissue. John 20, 17. Interesting how this lays out and what happens next. So Mary, hearing hearing her name, this is her response in verse 17. 
Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. (laughs) Now go instead and tell my brothers, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary (laughs) went then to the disciples with the news. Here's the title of this passage. I have seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. I've seen Him. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that He said these things to her. Right? So again, after Mary heard her name, she turned to Jesus And she either, we don't know, fell down on his feet and clung to him, right? Or she just gave him a big old hug, right? Held on to them. It's you. It's you. Like a long lost friend or someone you love dearly, seeing there was this connection. And Jesus had to tell her, Mary, you got to let me go. I can't breathe. He, he didn't say that, but I don't know what he said. Right? Hey, hey, Mary, Mary, Mary. <laughs> I'll let you know, hey, I, I'm going to go to the Father, right? But I'm not going like right now. I'm not going to disappoint you right now, right? I'm going to be around, right? But Mary, hey, hey, will you do this? You told the disciples, right? the tomb. Hey, 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 hey. Tell them that you saw me. Go and tell them this story. Now, Jesus didn't have to do that, (laughs) by the way. He could have said, watch this, and just appeared, like we're going to read next week. I'll tell them myself, Mary. (laughs) You're pretty emotional right now. I don't know if you're going to get it quite right. right. Or whatever, right? He could have done that. He could have sent angels. He could have just showed up. But he didn't. Why? Because he gives you and I the opportunity to share his message. Not just the opportunity, but he entrusts us to do so. Right? Now that you know, that you know him personally, now that you know about him, now that you experience him, and if you're a believer, you have a story to tell about Jesus. Right? Hey, hey, go and tell somebody. It's incredible that he trusts us with the greatest news in the world. So granted, when he comes again, mm, everyone's going to know. But until then, he says, hey, 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 you love me? You know this stuff? Hey, go tell somebody. I have the opportunity to carry this message to my neighbor. I have the opportunity to go to places like Kenya and beyond to tell them this message. We have been enlisted to carry the greatest message of all eternity. What a honor. What a privilege. What a responsibility. It's interesting also to me how this all kind of rolled out, right? Jesus didn't send the angels to Peter and John. Jesus didn't first appear to these respected disciples intentionally. I'm going to show up to Mary Magdalene. And that culture at that time, her testimony wouldn't even stand up in court. This is a demon-possessed female. You ain't going to listen to her. I'm just telling you how it was then. I'm not saying it's that way now, which I'm grateful for. 
But in that time, she was marginalized. <laughs> Jesus says, hey, watch this. <laughs> I'm going to tell Mary Magdalene first. And then I'm going to ask her to tell the message. Don't you love that? <laughs> Paul the Apostle picks up on this, right? This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, hey, 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 let me tell you, <laughs> none of you really are of a normal, nor, uh, noble birth, not very many of you. Not very many of you come from high position, right? But he goes on to say, mm, God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise, <laughs> God chooses the weak in this world to shame the strong. God chooses what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. That's our God. And I'm qualified according to this. To share the message. You got what I say? And so are we to carry. What a privilege. You understand this. Jesus was demonstrating this and saying, hmm, yeah, this is how this is going down. It's astounding to me who Christ Jesus is, who our God is always shown himself to be in here in this great getting up morning. Unveils himself in this way. This is the way God, this is the choice of God. What a great Savior we have. What a joy. What a privilege. What a king. Jesus invites you to see. He invites us to see. So look for him. He's been rolling, rolling away stones for a long time. <clears throat> and sometimes our job is just to remove obstacles so people can see who Jesus is. Look for him, learn of him, and trust yourself to him. Who do you say that I am? You and I have to determine not just who he is, but how we're going to value and relate to him. Jesus calls us by name. <laughs> know the voice of your friend your brother, your Lord, listen for him. Listen <coughs> to him. Read his word. Ask God to give you ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Know him. Love him. Honor him. And understand Jesus also entrusts us to share. Tell his story. Right? You, I, tell his story near, far, and wide. Share him with others living in fear and looking for hope. They are all around us. And I've found that to overcome fear, I have to get closer to Christ in love because love conquers fear. God, help me to love you more so that I have greater joy in communicating you to others. What a privilege we have. Share what you know and have experienced with the world. 
Now, Peter, this apostle who entered in later in his life, right? And we're going to read about Peter, right? I'll never deny you, deny, deny, deny you, right, Peter? The story's not over yet, right? Next few weeks leading up to Easter, we'll continue. And on Easter, I'm going to sum 35 or 55 messages up in one message. A braver me, right? We're going to see Peter. Later in his life, reflecting on the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus, wrote, Rejoice that God, through the resurrection of Jesus, has caused us to be born again into a living hope. And a glorious inheritance. We're going to close our service. Um, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing a song, Living Hope. Right, we're doing Living Hope. Yeah? Okay. I want the words to penetrate in your heart. Right. After the song, I'm going to give us a benediction. And by the way, if you have come to this place... You say, I want to commit my heart to Christ. We have people that are going to stand by that sign. Every week they're there to pray for you. Don't be like, I feel weird. Don't feel weird. Just pray for them. They're here. We're here. Let's pray. You'll have opportunities to do that. So let's pray together. Hmm. I... I I can't say enough, Lord, about what you mean and what this means. God, will you help us to understand? God, I ask that every person in this room who hears this message in the future online would know the great love of their Savior. who's even calling our names now, come and see. Be with me, understand. Resurrect our lives. Resurrect the lives of those we love, who instead of clinging to you are clinging to the darkness clinging to other things they think will save them or give them meaning or hope or value. But I ask that people will see the foolishness of these things and turn to you, Christ, who says, come and see. Thank you for calling me by name. Thank you for calling us by name. Thank you for calling out by name. Thank you for entrusting us with this message of great hope that is stronger than sin and even death. Because you live, we also live. Thank you for causing us to be born again into a living hope praised and glorified forever. Because of you, Christ, we pray.